Olive Branch, thanks for joining us tonight as we finish off our conversation with an eye to Easter. We've been doing studies in the book of Mark between passages in chapter 11 all the way through 16. Tonight we're going to hit 16, and this weekend was Easter, and we've been celebrating that. So we're going to start off with a song that we, we actually launched from Olive Branch on Easter and so excited about this song. We'd love for you guys to go ahead and join us as you get it. It's called Alive in Us, and so it starts out. dead, that you've given us all that we need, that your kingdom has come into our lives by your spirit, Then that day when you died, you ripped that curtain out, and you came rushing towards us to be in us, and we praise you, God, for that, we thank you, so come alive in us, we pray.
that he should send the love the world and set his son. But condemned and broken, his body slain, that I might see his death means victory for me. We will rise. Lord God, thank you that you, we are going to rise with you. That you've given us that we were condemned, that we were broken. You have indeed given yourself for us. We praise you for that. Teach us as we get into this word now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, well, thanks for singing with me. And we are going to be diving now back into Mark chapter 16. It's time to talk about the resurrection. Hey, um, we've been looking at this book, and let's remember the book of Mark is really seriously focused on the one question. Who is Jesus? He starts it off right at the beginning, and he makes the declaration, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? So this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what he is doing is he is trying to say, we know who Jesus is, but let's watch the discovery of who this Messiah is. And over and over and over again, Jesus is going to tell them, look, look, don't say anything, don't say anything. And then we hit that last week of which we've been looking at it. And man, he's proclaiming he's the Messiah, but he's saying, I'm not the Messiah you think I am. I'm the humble king. I'm not the, I'm not the high priest. I'm a high priest. I'm not that Messiah you think I am. I'm here to cleanse the temple, to call us to reach the nations, not destroy the nations. And over and over and over again, he shows himself as prophet. He shows himself as priest. He shows himself as king. He shows himself as teacher. He shows himself as, as the one who, who knows all of this stuff. And he's enthroned on his cross coming into his kingdom as he dies. And we go in that same route, and now he's in that tomb, and we're going to pick up there here in um, Mark chapter 16. If you got it, open your Bible there. We're going to jump in, and it starts this way. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Now, we've met these ladies before. Earlier on, they were standing, actually, you can look up, they're here at Jesus' crucifixion, verse 40, it says, There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and Joseph. So we get very clear, this is not, any of these people are not Mary, Jesus' mom. Mary is a very common name, very familiar name. And so we have Mary Magdalene. This is Mary, the mother of James, the, young, the, the lesser, the younger. This is not James and John's mom. She's not the mother of Zebedee. This is James, another one of the disciples. And so we have all these women. They're coming to bring spices. Now, the spices are in particularly used for the sake of rubbing it into the dead body to cause it to not smell as bad. And who's going to smell it? Who's going to see it? It's really just a sign of care. Some scholars have pointed out maybe they thought the men hadn't done a good job, something like that. And so they've come to actually anoint and rub these spices into the dead body of Jesus. And I want you to note that because they're not acting like Jesus is going to come back, right? They don't actually hold to anything like he's coming back. They are coming to rub spices into a decaying, decaying body. In their mind, Jesus is dead. He's done. And so it goes on. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Now, as we're looking at this, I want you to point out, I just want you to notice a couple things. First of all, it says it's very early on in the first day of the week. So this is Sunday, the first day of the week, right? We, not Monday. Monday is our first work week. But Sunday is the first day of the week, and people go to work, and the Sabbath is over. But also, this is a celebration time period. They are entering into the, un, the celebration of unleavened bread. That would last the whole week. By them going to the tomb, they're actually sacrificing their opportunity to celebrate. They're sacrificing and laying aside this opportunity for them to be a part of that because now they're going to be unclean having touched the dead body of Jesus. And so it's going to take them a little while, a whole day, in fact, to, to cleanse, to wash that off. And so they're willing to sacrifice that and go through that. So they're getting up early, and apparently this is when the sun had risen. Some people have argued very early on means typically before the sun rises. So likely they got up early, got their stuff together. By the time the sun had risen, they were heading off to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, 
hey, what are we going to do about that stone? And I think this is what's interesting. In all of this, we're not talking about guards. That's in Matthews and Luke's. We're not talking about a Sanhedrin or any of that stuff. Their big fat problem is a stone, is this thing right here. They're wondering, how are we going to do this? Jesus is dead, clearly dead. We're, we're, we're not thinking he's alive. And our big issue in all this mess is not what the world's going to think. Not No, we need to get there first to celebrate Jesus is alive. No, it's how are we going to move this big fat stone that was put there to keep grave robbers away. That's put there to keep people from desecrating Jesus' body. And so there's a couple of weird things about this. First of all, why is this stone the problem to them? I mean, shouldn't they have known Jesus was going to raise from the dead? I, a lot of people have pointed out that it's, it's more likely they should have been there going like with their little banners, I'm waiting for you, Jesus. I mean, a lot of us think, hey, we would have been there. We would have been waiting and celebrating. And yet, it's not what they're doing. They're clearly not aware of anything that's about to happen. And what's weird is it seemed to, should have been, look, look at this, three times in the life of Jesus' teachings, he tells them, just in the book of Mark, three times that he is going to rise on the third day. Look, let's take a peek at this real quick. What we see here is that in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, we wind up with him teaching about his suffering and teaching that he's going to um, go through all these problems, begin to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. Man, we've seen those three show up a lot in this book, right? And be killed. So he's going to die. And after three days, rise again. Maybe they thought they were supposed to come the next day. I, no. What's interesting about this is up here and before this, Peter's just declared, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And then he starts teaching him. And after this, Peter says, that ain't going to happen to you. That doesn't happen to the Messiah. And Jesus has to look and say, get behind me, Satan. The greatest rebuke in the history of humanity, right? Even belongs to Jesus. Jesus knows how to rebuke somebody. And what we have here actually is this incredible situation in which they ignore what Jesus says because they're all bent on him being the Messiah. Similarly, in Mark chapter 9, verse 31, they're, they're tooting around in, um, out in Galilee, and they're actually talking. Uh, Jesus is turning to them. He's going to start teaching them about this same thing. He says, For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. So he's going to die. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. I don't think Jesus is being ambiguous here. But what's interesting is that shortly after this, it says that they were afraid to ask him anything. They weren't actually going to talk to him because they were afraid what, what, he might be, what he might say. Or we're not sure. We're not, just, we're not sure why they're afraid in the first place. But it clearly says that afterwards they did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask. Hmm. Jesus has just transfigured himself earlier in, this ver in these verses. He's just revealed that he is God to three of these guys. And maybe it's inconceivable to them that this one who is this son of man, this one who has all this power, is somehow going to be killed and in three days rise. Maybe they're just like, we don't know what that means. I don't want to look like an idiot. I mean, he is, after all, this awesome king who casts out demons and does this stuff. Uh, yeah, Jesus, we get it. Some scholars think maybe they were just thinking, hey, you know, this is heavy. I'm afraid what that means for me. I'm not going to ask him. I kind of have a feeling that what was really going on with these guys is that they were just honestly thinking he's the Messiah. This is going to be awesome. He's not going to die. I mean, we, we know this is going to work out. And they just weren't willing to admit they didn't know what he was talking about. Now, Mark 10, 34, however, is another interesting one. We get into this. It's Jesus tells them they're, gonna, they're going to mock him. He's on his way into Jerusalem. He's about to enter into the whole scenario we've been talking about, approaching Jerusalem, final week of his life. He says, look, they're going to mock the Son of Man. They're going to spit on him. They're going to flog him. They're going to kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Man, he says it three times very clearly. What is going on with these guys? Well, funny thing, right after this, you know what they start arguing about? Who's the greatest? John and James start popping up, and they're like, uh, our mom has a question for you. Can we like sit at your right hand and your left hand, you know, like have the power you got? And Jesus is like, really? 
really. And what we see here is that they just seem to be so fixated on their version of Messiah, their version of military king. We're going to sit in thrones with Jesus. Woo-hoo! We're going to conquer the world. That they're not hearing him. They didn't hear him. They didn't understand him. They thought he was being cryptic, and he wasn't. And so when we come to these women, it's no wonder they're there. Maybe they didn't believe it either. Maybe they didn't understand what Jesus was talking about either. And so as they approach, you start to ask, why in the world, why in the world did these women not understand this? Why were they not ready for a resurrection? Why weren't they, why were they bringing spices and thinking the stone is their biggest problem? He said it three times. Should have been clear by this point, but it wasn't. And I think here's the real issue. Resurrection is a hard thing to believe. It's hard to believe. If you grew up as a Christian or you grew up in the Christian world, man, resurrection is just like one of those things you got to believe, man. Boom, Jesus rose from the dead. I know it. Hey, man, here we go. Resurrections happen. Stop for a minute. Resurrections are so wildly not occurring that he seems to be the only one who's ever had this happen without the aid of some kind of prophet or somebody touching him. Jesus resurrects from the dead all by himself. God brings him back. Resurrections are hard to believe in because they don't happen. In fact, I think this is important because the question I want to kind of ask after that is why then would Jesus choose a resurrection if it's so hard to believe? And that's one of the things I love to talk about. I'll just bring it in here for a second. I think God chose a resurrection because it's the one thing that is so rare, so out of bounds, so inescapably pointing to the divine that everybody would have to sit up and listen if it happened. Everyone fears death. Every culture fears death. Every culture fears. Every person fears. It doesn't matter what language they speak. It doesn't matter any of this stuff. Death is the number one thing everyone will face and everyone fears. And what's crazy is God chose the one thing that is humanly universal. And he said, I'm going to flip that to get your attention. And so, yeah, resurrection is hard to believe. In fact, in, Jewish, in the Jewish time period of Jesus, um, what we see is actually there was debate over the resurrection. The Pharisees argued there was a resurrection. The, Sa- the Sadducees said there wasn't. See, the Pharisees held to the whole Old Testament, and the Sadducees said, no, only the first five books, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So those first five were the, the Torah. That's all they held to. And in those first five, there's no mention of a resurrection. And so they said, there is no resurrection. We don't have to believe in that. It gives us the temple. We got what we need. And yet, the Pharisees had studied the scriptures, and they had read the Psalms, they had looked at the Proverbs, and the heartbeat of the Psalms and the Proverbs were two things. One, the Psalms were aching for justice. They were like, God, how can you allow us to die and allow injustice to reign? And so the concept of the, ju- of the judgment was there. The concept also that how can you let righteous people, your people, die, and we just go to the pit and never come back? And the idea was that you're not going to allow that to happen. You're going to bring us to the good life. You're going to bring us to the right life. Proverbs seems to over and over and over again state that if you live the good life, it leads to life, not to death. And yet we die. Ecclesiastes is very clear about this. And so there was this Jewish wisdom and argument going on. What about God's justice? What about the righteous who die? How is God going to reconcile this mess? And and in comes Isaiah, and he makes a proclamation in Isaiah, actually chapter 26, verse 19. And he says, look, those who are laying in the dust, they're going to come to life. And there's this promise of a sudden resurrection. Daniel, in chapter 12, verse 2, is actually going to announce himself. Like, look, there is this resurrection that's going to happen. Some to eternal life, some to judgment. But this, these people who are in the dust are going to come to life. And then there's this other final piece. Again, in Isaiah chapter 53. I don't have it up here on the screen. But man, you've got to, got to, got to read this chapter again this week as you're looking at it. I want to read just a section of it to you. It's talking about the servant of God. He's going to die for our iniquities. He's going to be whipped, bruised, all that stuff. He's going to be ignored. He's going to be oppressed so that we could be saved, right? And so verse 10 picks up. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, soul not his spiritual soul, his body, makes an offering for guilt, meaning he's died, he's given himself over, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, 
The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And many people have pointed to this. How can somebody who gives his life as an offering and dies, very clearly pierced for our iniquities, crushed for our transgressions, wind up seeing his offspring? Except for the fact that he was risen from the dead. Resurrection over and over and over again becomes clearer and clearer and clearer till when Jesus comes, he says, I'm going to resurrect. In fact, in John, we know that he goes to Mary and Martha and says, I'm, gonna, I'm the resurrection and the life. And they go, we know, we're going to raise him in the end. And she's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm the resurrection. And here he is, the resurrection. But it's hard to believe it, even debated in his time. Even today, when we talk to our friends about the resurrection of Jesus, the first thing we got to remember is people aren't just going to believe this. It takes evidence. It takes information. It takes clarity that this has truly happened because resurrections don't happen. They're hard to believe. And so when we look at this text, we're going to discover a lot of interesting pieces here from the text. And so we move on. The ladies are there. They've got their spice. They've got this stone problem. In fact, something now happens next. Too often we read this text too fast, so I want to slow down real quick. And now here we are in the book of Mark, back in verse 4. And what we have is suddenly these women walk up. They come around the corner. They're talking about, how in the world are we going to get this thing... Um, the stone, giant stone, moved away. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. Lots of focus on the stone. Why? Because if it's very large and this stone is rolled away, that probably means there was a lot of dudes who did it. Something's happened. And they're going to stop and they're going to look at that stone. It's open. They're thinking, what's going on here? You would be thinking that, going, you're not expecting a resurrection. They're walking up. They're seeing the stone opened. They're probably cautiously turning around the corner, cautiously looking at the problem. And so they're here engaged in this. I mean, the stone is critical to the tension in the text. Because, look, it's the focus. It's very large. The stone's mentioned twice in a row. And it doesn't say who moved it. And so the tension rises. Maybe someone's here stealing the body of Jesus. Maybe it's the Pharisees. Maybe it's the Romans. Maybe it's grave robbers. This is not safe for women. All the tension's there. What is going on here? And so we come, they come around the corner. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man. I love that. Uh, just... Uh, Mark is kind of like, he's just a young man. He looked like a young man. He's sitting on the right side. That's an interesting detail. And he's dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And so I love this. The women come around. They see a man there, and what do they do? They're alarmed. Ah! They're freaked out. What is going on here? They're worried they can't lift the stone. Now the stone's gone. Now they're really alarmed. And, and this word is doubled over right here. Do not be alarmed, he says, because they're freaking out. They're probably like, ah! They probably screamed, something like that. And I love this because just note all the emotional words in the text. I mean, when we note these emotional words, it's so beautiful because... It's human reactions. They're alarmed. They're trembling. They're scared. They're astonished. They're like, what in the world? They're afraid. These are not the words of people you'd expect. Uh, These are not words of people that are expecting a resurrection. These are words of people who are being blown away again by Jesus, even in his death and his resurrection. They, they don't know what to do. These are real human emotions. And I just wonder, how would you have responded? I mean, I don't know if we'd be cool or not. I don't know if we'd have, like, jumped the angel, you know, attacked him, just like, oh, no, you didn't. I'm, I'm on you, man. You'd have, like, give me back that body. Where'd you, where'd you take him? I don't know if you, probably safer to have the women show up first than the disciples, to be honest. And here we go. They're screaming. They're freaked out. But how would you respond? Bewildered? Would you, confused? I think we probably would have responded very similarly. Maybe right there on your feet, just let everybody else know how you think you might have responded. <laughs> I'm kind of curious to know. But what we see here is what in the world is going on? Why is he sitting on the right? What is that all about? And this is one of those details again that I want you guys to keep in mind of. Um, actually, if we go to Jerusalem, there's a couple of places that are argued for as the tomb of Jesus. One's called the Garden Tomb. The other is found in the Holy Sepulchre. It's a, it's a giant church that's been built over the spot they claim is the tomb. And I get it. There's a lot in our hearts. They're like, man, I would love it to be the Garden Tomb. It says there's a garden. There's no garden at the Holy Sepulchre. Look. We do know, after archaeological digs and information, the garden tomb is not the tomb of Jesus. It is a 4th century tomb. It's not an actual 
first century tomb. It's kind of 300 years too late to be Jesus's. And, but it's a great illustration of what it would look like. In our case, what I've done here is I've taken from the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Background Commentaries. Awesome set of commentaries if you can get them. they got a lot of great background information for you. And this is kind of the picture of the tomb that we see in the Holy Sepulchre, which is likely the actual tomb. After you begin to um, examine the reality of this, this place that has been laid over, we, we discover that what has gone on in this, in, this, uh, in this church that's been built on top is actually now the kind of the location Jesus found. They dug in a, few, a couple years ago, I think now, and discovered it's a first century tomb. It's been a place that people have gone to over and over and over again. And so we see that this is kind of the place that they would have gone to. This blue outline is the small building um, above ground tomb that was put on top of it in around the fourth century. And so likely what would have gone on is you're looking at all this red. These would have been places they would have put the bodies and they would have laid them out. And so if you said he was sitting on the right, it means they were over here probably somewhere in this location, sitting somewhere in this zone on the right. Maybe Jesus' body had been placed in one of these or on a ground spot over here. There's um, not really clarity, but the, the body's gone. And the angel is sitting where it was. And he's making it clear, hey guys, check it out. This, this is where he was. He ain't here. And that's where we begin to now move into a conversation as we look at this, this whole tomb with their little chambers here. This whole thing would have been what it originally looked like, and they built that whole thing on top of it with this pit in the middle, and the bodies would have been laid out and eventually put into these chambers. So what we have is all these different opportunities to kind of see that he was sitting over here on the right. All right, good, we got that. There's a detail. And that's what I find fascinating is these details because the details are important. We need to note the details. First of all, we knew it was early in the morning. Very fixated on that. We knew that the stone was very heavy, right? A very heavy stone. And here now, we have he sits at the right. Sits at the right side of the tomb. Why do we need to know that? What are the specific, except this is eyewitness stuff. This is what they really saw. This is what they really um, encountered. And we're getting an actual source material here. This is what happened. And so now we engage with the actual um, statement that is given to us by this angel. Now, how do you know it's an angel, Greg? Well, this white robe stuff here, this indicates an angelic thing. When Jesus ascended on the, in the trans, or sorry, ascended, but went to the transfiguration on the top of the mountain, he glowed. We didn't have gleaming white back then. Trust me, even their togas were dirty because you didn't have the opportunity to bleach things like we do today. A white robe was gleaming because it meant divinity. It meant there was an, a spiritual being in your presence. That's also why they were alarmed. The presence often of a spiritual being brings alarm, shocks them. And so he says, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. Now, this is important because Mark actually likes to use the name of Jesus like this, which, as you'll notice later, I'm not going to get into verses 9 and further. And yet here what's interesting is Jesus is never referenced like Jesus of Nazareth over and over. It's a different way, Lord Jesus and these things. John, Mark never does that. Mark always uses this concept of like Jesus of Nazareth, this kind of very focused idea. And so you seek Jesus of Nazareth. He was, who was crucified. And then we have the message. That awesome message, he is risen. He is not here. Any points? See where they see the place where they laid him? That's a weird statement. I mean, this is literally as if you're there. And the women are like, he turned to us, see the place where he laid him? No, I can't see the place. I'm not there. But the point is that this is this is a detail. This is like so real. There's their eyewitness testimony here. He is risen. He's not here. Jesus is alive. Just as he said, same words. He's come back from the dead. And these women are blown away. Look, no body. And this is an angel saying this. And heaven has made the declaration to us. Heaven has announced to us what humanity was not allowed to see. The resurrection of Jesus. And now these women are given the opportunity to be the first witnesses of the empty tomb. 
the angel tells them, hey, here's what I need you to do. Now, go and tell his disciples, and this is what I love, and Peter. That is so intimate. Why is Peter singled out? Well, the disciples, they all ran, right? They're all running off, getting away. But Peter here, good old Peter, he was the one who denied. Almost like left him alone. Like, what, what happened to Peter? Is he like Judas? What happened to Judas? No, go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going to go before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. There's the promise. The promise of God, they would see the resurrected Jesus. Hey, Jesus is pretty good about his promises. God seems to be really good about his promises here. Three days now he's risen. He was going to die. He's going to suffer. How many prophecies has he fulfilled already, right? And here he is giving another promise. Go to Galilee. You'll see me and get Peter. This is, in a very real way, Peter's kind of comment that, hey, what Jesus did is he brought me back in the fold. He reconciled me. I denied him, but he didn't deny me. The angels are saying, go get him. The disciples ran, but they're going to be brought back in. They're going to come in. They're going to hear. They're going to see. They're going to be witnesses of him. That's the promise. And ladies, you're going to go tell them to go see him. Jesus told you these things. He told you he was going to be risen. He told you that he had this mission for you. Guys, this is the beauty. Jesus already told them. And so we're not shocked that now he sends them out. And so we finish up. And they went out and fled from the tomb. They fled? They fled? So they're running. They're freaked. They're scared. They're trembling, it says. And astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They said nothing? Wait, what's going on here? Because, to be quite honest, if you look down, it says, some of the early manuscripts do not include verses 9 through 20. And I'm under the conclusion that the rest of the text doesn't actually belong in, um, in the book of Mark. Who it's written by, we're not sure, but here I just want to make it clear that we're not going to get into this. Now, um, there are some commentaries that give you information on that, and you can look those up. But the bottom line is, uh, the best evidence in all of our cases is this is the end. And so, this is the end of the book. They are gone. They run. All done. Really? This is the end? What about the rest? Where's Jesus' appearances when the disciples go see him in Galilee? I mean, isn't there supposed to be like a great commission statement? What's going on? I think a lot of people felt that way. That's why we suddenly get this kind of finishing mark that's been added in. I think a lot of people are wondering, like, Mark, you can't just end it like this. What are you doing? So what is Mark doing here? What is going on? Now, I think it's really important. Without the sightings of Jesus and the women being scared and running off, here's what we do know. The women didn't stay silent. We just had the eyewitness testimony right here about what's going on with details about the time of day. They're taking spices, how big the stone is. I mean, and it's all from a woman's perspective. That's amazing. And so what is Mark doing here? Mark's giving you the women's story. They didn't stay silent. They told them. They went and saw Jesus. You get the impression that it all happened but we stop with them being afraid. We stop with them not speaking because that's what the disciples did when they encountered problems. They ran. What are the women doing? They're running. What are we going to do? That's the challenge I think Mark is laying. Mark is really challenging us in the end. How are you going to respond? This is a literary technique like in the book of Jonah. Just kind of boom, done. Jonah the racist sitting there angry at God that he's going to um, save Nineveh and I'm still ticked. All right. Well, how's it going to end? How are you going to be Israel is like Jonah's question. You get the end of Acts, and Paul's going to be dying. And it's like, are you going to carry on the message, church? In this case, Mark is stopping in the same kind of way. He's like, boom, women, done. They run off, didn't say nothing. But are you going to say something? Are you going to speak? Are you going to act like them? You know he's resurrected. They told it. They spoke. Are you going to get over your fear? In your time of testing, will you bear witness to Jesus? In your time of testing, are you going to open your mouth and share Jesus Christ? Yes, it's hard to believe in the resurrection. But are we going to bring the evidence? Are we going to talk about the eyewitnesses? Are we going to look at the various pieces of material we've been given through history? Are we going to look at the fact that there's a church and that this podunk, nobody rabbi in the middle of Israel, if he hadn't risen from the dead, would never have been known? 
And yet here we have a movement of the church transforming the world for 2,000 years. Boom, you got evidence. What are you going to do when somebody asks you? What are you going to do when somebody challenges you? Are you going to be a witness? That's what Mark leaves us with. That's what Mark challenges us with. Will you open your mouth even when it's hard? Will you open your mouth even when you're scared? Will you open your mouth? Go bring the news. Jesus is alive. He's borne your sins. The kingdom of God has come. The king is enthroned. He is here. He has done it. Will you let other people know? Go share it. Go share it. Go share it. That's exactly what he's doing. And I want to challenge us with the same challenge that Mark gives us. We now know who Jesus is. We know what kind of Messiah he is. Will we go announce it to everyone else? Will we announce the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I hope that we will. Let me pray. God, give us courage. Give us strength to announce it. It's a good news. It is powerful news. Even when we're scared, may we be witnesses. And may we announce it. And may we let people know. We ask that you help us do that. In the name of Jesus, amen.